It's time to bring out our first two competitors in the Group of Death Group C. Our first competitor is one of the top five Magic the Gathering players of all time. His name is Luis Scott Vargas. Now, before every tournament, the players are asked to submit a few factoids about themselves. And Luis submitted one of them as consensus one of the top five players of all time. Nice submission. Our second competitor from the United States of America, longtime magic player and entrepreneur, it is Cedric Phillips. Louise will be playing Mono Red and Esper Control. Cedric will be playing Mono White and Mono White. Can't waste cardboard, can ya? Let's head into match number one. Over to you, commentators. Thank you, Day9. And uh, as you saw, there's a lot of bad blood between these two players. Okay, fine. They may be playing it up a little bit. But I'll tell you what, one of the things that is definitely true is that at their heart, both of these are highly competitive individuals, and they really do want to win, trash talk aside. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's all fun and games to trash talk, but we still are playing for a lot of money and prestige, and both these players are going to give it their all. Yeah. You know, I've been following uh, Luis's career closely for a long time. He's a close friend of mine. We do a podcast together. And I went up to him uh, while he was sitting there waiting for us to go live on the air. How you feeling, buddy? He said, I'm nervous. Like, I'm legitimately nervous. And this is somebody who has played in 10 uh, Mythic Championship slash pro, pro Tour top eights in his career. He's kind of seen it all. Let's take a look at the list that the players have brought. Luis Scott Vargas has, well, kind of what has become one of the default combos here, an aggressive deck, like, and a control deck. This is Esper Control. Yeah, his Esper Control looks pretty close to what we've seen from all the competitors yesterday. I mean, there's not a lot of differences in, in them. He opted for two Masterminds acquisitions. I think most of the ones we saw yesterday had one. There was one we saw with four. Uh, he's got an Ixalan's Binding in his deck, which is not something you see, but at the same time, it does the same thing as what, you know, any removal spell does. It's right. just a different variety. And speaking of the Mastermind's acquisition here, David, there's the uh, sideboard. So those are the cards, all one of that he will be able to pull from to help him uh, get over the top on any matchup that he's facing. His other deck, though, he's went fully on the other side of the spectrum. Now, many of the players in the field went for Mono White in this spot, but Luis is on red. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I talked to some other pro players last night, and it, Mono Red seems to trump Mono White. That's sort of what people know. And we were kind of confused whether it wasn't more Mono Red, especially considering everybody's running Mono White. So Luis opted for the Mono Red strategy. He is running the Experimental Frenzies with 19 Mountains, which I'm a big fan of, as we saw the power of Experimental Frenzy yesterday with Sky Bills in her match. So uh, I really actually like his build of Mono Red here. Okay. Now on the other side of the table, Cedric, well, he kept things very, very simple for us here. He is known, by the way, if you're new to Magic, Cedric, he has a Pro Tour Top 8 from back in 2009. And he Top 8'd with a deck similar to this. We call it a White Weenie Strategy or a Mono White Aggro, a small creature-based deck. And he's running it in both of his slots here, David. This is his deck for no matter what. I mean, no changes. A man does one thing well, so just why change? Why not stick with it? I, I mean, mean, 18 lands, 4 of, 4 of, 4 of, 4 of. I mean, it's just that he kept it real simple. Yeah, I mean, there's something to say about running the same deck twice. You do give your opponent the advantage of when they're selecting their deck, if you make it to game three, they know exactly what you're going to be doing. So you take away that part of it, whereas in the other matches, you have to kind of wonder, well, what deck will they bring? What matches up better against it? Luis won't have that problem. That's right. And this is going to be really interesting to see how this goes, because one of the other advantages that you get by picking the same deck is during testing, right? You just get to grind the same thing and really get perfect as, as, as close as you can. And this is also an archetype that Cedric already is partial to. So, you know, he's probably going to be in tip-top shape with this one deck, but that lack of flexibility might come back to get him. Yeah, he's been testing this deck his whole life. Yeah, so basically. I, I think he's ready. But, I mean, Luis Scott Vargas can test two decks. I don't think it's like it's any extra you yeah. know, task for him because he had to learn two decks. He knows how to play. Yeah, that's right. Um, also, we're going to remember here that this weekend we have uh, card styles. You're going to be seeing those on screen during the course of the weekend, and uh, you can get those right now on Arena. It's kind of cool when you get one of those. Uh, check it out. Oh, this is great. I forgot about this. Promo code. Check this out. So you can get in there, premium scry, and you'll get one of the uh, one of the card styles. Oh, I know what it is. I think you know what it is. You get Indeed. the ops. You get, you get the, the cool... Yeah. Fancy looking opt. Right, and so they look really cool. You'll see them on screen throughout the course of uh, the weekend here, and you can get them right now on Arena by using that promo code. So get on there, log on, and uh, get your premium uh, styled opts. They're really, really cool. 
Um, so yeah, players are seated. We're just about ready here uh, to get rolling um, for them. Again, from Cedric's perspective, we'll, we already know what he's playing regardless of coin flips or anything like that. But for, for Luis, what is he on? Well, it looks like he's drawn his, uh, his Esper deck here. Now, the interesting part here is that he's also on the play, it looks like. He's on the play, but this hand, he's oh, got five cards that cost four or more. Two of them with, or excuse me, two different cards. Three of them with very specific mana requirements, and he's only got one black, one white mana. Hollow Fountain Swamp. This hand is it's pretty slow, and it's going to need to draw some lands and some cheap spells to interact. I would assume he's going to mulligan that, right? Is that a um, keeper for you? I'd, I think I would mulligan it. Okay, and he is on the play, so he's got that going for him. But, you know, the one thing that this mono white deck is really known for is consistency. It's, you know what it's going to do. It's going to go creature, creature, creature. And if you stumble with Luis's, if that hand, if Luis keeps that hand and doesn't fill it in, it's not going to work out well for him. Yeah, this is a little bit of a slow hand here for Cedric as well, but still, you know, any any one or two drop off the top and he's off to the races. Yeah, this is one of those hands we talked about yesterday. It's close, but you're not going to mulligan it. You just have to fill it in. You have to hope your deck rewards you. Cedric's deck is all one-drop creatures, so he's likely to draw a couple of those in the first two turns to fill that draw in. All right, well, let's see if Luis is going to keep this opening hand here, David. This is the first big decision of the match. And take a look at Luis as he dials in and gets focused. I'm telling you, he was feeling it sitting there. And this is from one of the most experienced players as far as high-level play goes. He's played for thousands of dollars multiple times before. And uh, he's feeling he wants this real bad. Actually, Cedric looks like he's in chill mode here. He's like, yeah, well, I've seen this hand before. I might even, might even keep it. Yeah, I mean... I think Luis's decision is pretty tough. I mean, I think that's what he's thinking about. I, I, I still don't know what I, I think I would mulligan that hand, but it's kind of one of those hands where maybe you just got to, you know, fill it in. But the problem is if your first few draw steps are lands, which is what you need, you're also not drawing business, which is what you need because you don't have anything to do until turn four. So it's like if you draw the specific land you need, a second white and a second black, sure, turn four you can cast Kai's Wrath and catch up. But if you draw maybe an island in there, you're not going to cast Kai's Wrath. You're casting Chemistry's Insight as your first play on turn four while you're getting beat down by likely a bunch of 2-1 two, uh, two creatures for one. So I think I lean toward mulliganing it, but Luis is the expert with this deck. Yeah, we'll find out the answer uh, momentarily here when Luis gets to make his decision. And again, this talks about... All right, looks like we're underway oh. here. Let's, Let's see. see if he's going to mulligan this. He, he did. did. He shipped that one back, and he's got a keeper here with Thought Erasure, Kai's Wrath, and Vraska's Contempt, question mark? Well, the interesting part about that hand is it doesn't have any lands with basic land types, so all his lands are going to come and play tapped unless he finds one. Wow, and Cedric also mulliganed. Cedric shipped that back. He, he did not trust Trusty Rusty there, the Rustwing Falcon. He's going to go ahead and send it. And it looks like both players have kept their sixes, so we are off to the races here. Yeah, Cedric's hand's a lot better. It's four one-drops and two planes, so he can have his whole entire hand on the board by turn three. Uh, Luis, though, does have the Kai's Wrath. He does need one more black source. Ideally for him right now, he would draw a Watery Grave so he can cast Thought Erasure this turn, and it'll set up all his future lands coming to play untapped, and he can cast Kai's Wrath on turn four. Opener for Cedric here. Just a bunch of one-drops. Yeah, it's not too here, difficult, but his yeah. decision here was does he want to get two power on the board or does he want to save the Dauntless Bodyguard so that it can Ooh. protect a creature? Drown Catacomb off the top of the library there, David. Yeah, this is so another land that comes into play tap. It does though. come into play tap, but it was the other black mana source. And another one drop Sky Marcher Aspirants to draw step here for Cedric. Yeah, this is rough because the Legion's landing encourages Cedric to get multiple creatures on the battlefield, but that sets him up to walk into a Kai's Wrath. Although when you are playing a white weenie deck, your goal is to put your creatures in the battlefield. You just have to either hope they don't have the wrath or hope that you have creatures that can survive through it. So Cedric's going to chip in there for two damage, knock Luis down to 18 after casting Legion's Landing and a Snubhorn Sentry. There's that Thought Erasure now from Luis. And he's going to see a hand with a second copy of Legion's Landing and then another Aspirant. So, you know, there's no easy pick. It wasn't like there's a Banalish Marshal coming up next turn or something like that. But again, this is starting to sting a little bit here, David. You pointed this out. Tap land, tap land, tap Ooh. land. Really slow for Luis. Very, Ooh. very key card here. Unbreakable formation off the top of the library there for yeah. Cedric. That is the card that uh, that Luis wanted to take away last turn. Right, and especially since Luis saw that he didn't have it, he's going to think he doesn't. So when he does go for the Kai's Wrath, which he did just draw Hollow Fountain here, he can actually drop the Hollow Fountain, take two, and cast the Kai's Wrath. Cedric to have the unbreakable formation, that's some really bad luck here. Cedric's thinking about it, but come on. 
you got to protect this board, do you not? And Luis says, uh, <laughs> of course, of course, of course he had it. Notice Luis's reaction, though. He didn't even flinch. He did. He, he nodded to he it. He nodded, but he For, didn't He didn't sigh. He didn't. He just, yeah, you know, he's hey, not going to show you anything. No, that's part of magic. That's indeed, indeed. But in the meantime, uh, basically acting as a counterspell. Unbreakable formation, when you don't cast it during your own main phase, just gives your creatures that indestructible yeah. and uh, is going to save them. But they don't get the plus one, plus one counters, so it's just a one for one. But Luis is left now trying to find ways to start to answer these creatures one at a time. Yeah, and Cedric is setting up so that he gets the city's blessing to turn on his Snubborn Sentry because the Legion's landing creates two permanents. The Dauntless Bodyguard gives him number 10. Things looking good for Cedric Phillips here in game number one. Yeah, this looks like uh, unless Luis draws another Kai's Wrath, Cedric Phillips is going to take this next turn. But even so, the Dauntless Bodyguard's protecting a creature, and Adonto the first fort can make another creature of the following turn. So looks good for Cedric right here. Luis finds the land for the turn. He does have Raska's Contempt that he can use to kill a bodyguard. He would take three, four, five, six damage. He'd be up nine life. He can actually kill a Snubhorn Sentry because it exiles a bodyguard sure. protecting it doesn't do anything and it'll sure. save him three and gain two. But even so, so he's that still would put gonna, him at, at nine. <coughs> put him at nine. Him he's going to take six and go to three, but then he still needs to, to draw Kai's Wrath specifically this turn. All right. Raska's Contempt's going to exile the snub, the Snubhorn Sentry down to three, and this is a big draw step now for Luis Scott Vargas, and he finds Mastermind's Acquisition. Is there anything he can get with that? Uh, he could get a Moment of Craving, Moment of Craving one of the bodyguards, go to five and take, nope, because the Adon to the first fort will make another creature, which will leave him with five power, so I'd actually... What about Healing Grace? Healing Grace, he would gain three life, prevent three and gain three, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that gives him another turn. Hey, another turn is exactly what the doctor ordered, right? Yeah, I mean, you've got to go for it. It's better than, than conceding the game, but I still just don't know what he can draw the following turn because even Kai's Wrath, I don't think, will do it. That might not save him because of the bodyguards. It depends on if the bodyguard is on the other bodyguard or if it was on the Snubhorn Sentry. But Adonto the First Ward is just going to keep generating these 1-1 one, one vampires. What about Cry of the Carnarium off the top of the library? It, it would get him out of the weeds right now, but again, like we said, Adonto the First Fort doesn't stop. You know, he's, he needs a Field of Ruin, and you know, he doesn't have one in his sideboard. Yeah, we saw not that many players playing Field of Ruin in their board, and uh, dealing with Adonto the First Fort is pretty problematic. So Luis goes up to six, and he'll prevent two from one of the bodyguards, which leaves him at a lowly one life, and Cedric has to decide whether to run West Wing Falcon out there. He wisely decides to keep it, and that is game number one going to Cedric... Phillips, he's on the board. He's got that white weenie deck at the ready. And he's got another one lined up uh, for game number two as well. Yeah, I mean, Luis knows exactly what, I mean, he would know either way, but he knows exactly his game plan. Mono Red is, I think, where he wants to be against this mono white deck. Goblin Chain Whirler is just so powerful against so many one toughness creatures. So I think Luis feels a little bit better about this matchup. What about play draw? Luis will be on the draw for this game number two. Yeah, that's the brutal part. Being on the draw is a, is a it's pretty rough. Uh, you really want it to set this matchup where you're on the play, but at least being on the draw, it makes the turn Chain Whirlers a lot more effective because your opponent is likely have to deploy most of their one toughness creatures first, and you get to follow up and sweep them off the board. Looks like players are going to quickly take a look at the deck list. Again, Luis has an easier job here as Cedric has uh, chosen his option of submitting the same deck twice. <laughs> I was, I was commenting how we looked at our deck list, and it was nine lines of or 12 <laughs> lines of text for both his decks combined because it's just the uh, same deck twice. Which is hilarious because Luis just takes up a page and a half because he's, he's even got a sideboard. sideboard yeah. Two decks, yeah, this is pretty <laughs> incredible. But funny anecdote, I, I get off the plane, and uh, Cedric's uh, executive assistant and friend, Christian Keith, is on the flight. And he looks at me, and he, he doesn't know what Cedric submitted. He goes, I hope he didn't submit two mono white <laughs> decks. He goes, that's just so Cedric. <laughs> And sure enough, he <laughs> That's did. That's exactly what he did. All right, opening hands here for game number two. Cedric took a mulligan. He did indeed, but Luis did not. And he's got a pair of lightning strikes, a wizard's lightning, and that key goblin chain whirler that you mentioned on the onset there, David. So a reasonable op opener for him, though not a lot of action early. Yeah, and Cedric's opener is, uh, is pretty nice. I mean, he's got three one-drops and a conclave tribunal and two land after the mulligan. So he's able to cast everything in his, in his hand. And uh, it actually, I think, is, is okay against Chain Whirler because this Nubhorn Sentry will live and the Bodyguard can protect the Aspirant. So it's not so bad. Looks like it was a shock there. Yeah, Luis 
opted not to take any damage from any of the creatures. I think with the mulligan and having all this one-for-one -one removal spells, he can just sit here and trade with Cedric's creatures, and eventually Cedric will run out of gas. Yeah, certainly uh, opting to not be too greedy with his Goblin Chain Whirler play, instead just picking off creatures one by one. This one particularly effective. He's giving Cedric the option of using that Dauntless Bodyguard yeah. here to protect the sentry. Yeah, it doesn't seem like much uh, lightning strike in O3, but Luis knows that if Cedric protects it, he's taking zero damage, and Cedric is a long way from 10 permanents. Yeah. The other thing that's interesting here as well is, <coughs> is Luis doing that on his main phase again, respecting, uh, well, exactly the type of cards that Cedric has in his hand, two different Convoke cards here. Says, I don't even want you to untap with the creature, and he is just killing everything. Luis playing the control game here with his mono red deck. Yeah, and, and the fact that he's got experimental frenzy times four lets him do that. Yeah, and with Cedric Phillips' deck needs to get a jump early, it doesn't play this long game very well. I mean, it's just, he's got four mana, two cards in hand, and his play on turn five is just hunted witness. I mean, this is unreal. Luis is at 20 life. He's facing one power. This is not how it's supposed to go from Cedric's side. Yeah, as we saw, these white decks usually like to ha go wide and have a lot of creatures on the board, pump them up. I'm not sure how Cedric pulls, pulls out of this. Yeah, now Cedric's down to just the 1-1 one -one on the ground versus Goblin Chain Roller, which just hit the battlefield, wiping away that Hunted Witness. Another Hunted Witness off the top of the library, though, for Cedric means that he can play that, plus Venerated locks it on this turn. Big Elephant hits the battlefield going to pump up the Witness and the Token as well. Put those out of range for a second Goblin Chain Whirler, but Luis is happy to just play defense here. And look at this, another Venerated Loxodon. Back-to-back Loxodons, maybe that's good enough? Yeah, that's a great draw. I mean, it, it, these creatures are getting out of range. Now the Shock actually doesn't kill anything. It, it can combine with the First Strike of the Chain Whirler or take down the Venerated Loxodon. I think that's Luis's plan. But uh, Cedric is going to likely go for Conclave Tribunal to move the Chain Whirler out of the way and start attacking. And that Tribunal will stick, and it will stay. Mono Red doesn't have any way to interact with that type of card, so there it is, Conclave Tribunal. And Cedric has drawn four lands, so he doesn't have to tap any of his creatures, so he can use the mana to uh, cast the Tribunal and then have all his creatures left to attack. I, I might have spoke too soon. It looks like Cedric has, has pulled back in this game. Yeah, Cedric's looking really good here all of a sudden after the back-to-back -back Venerated Loxodon. I mean, two turns ago, he had one power on the battlefield. Yeah, it was looking now he's pretty, got 15. <laughs> it was looking pretty grim two turns ago, but now I actually like Cedric's spot. Yeah, so Luis is going to be forced to use burn spells to take out creatures, plus trading off his only creature. That's going to leave Cedric, though, with a full eight power, and Luis is completely out of gas and up against the ropes. He needs something now, and Fanatical Firebrand is not it. Cedric yeah. Phillips very close to winning here. Luis needed a, uh, ex an experimental frenzy that turn, I believe. And then to start going off right away, too. He's still got a chance. Uh, I mean, he's only going to go to four right here. If he were to draw an experimental frenzy, he can have the Firebrand back to block and maybe chain some burn spells to get rid of the other two creatures. Let's see if what he finds here. It's only a shock off the top of the library, and it looks like the draw step has failed Luis, and Cedric Phillips is in beautiful shape here. Yeah, he's going to have to block the Loxodon, sack the Firebrand to target one of the 3-3 three, three creatures and finish it off with a shock and go to one life. Look at Cedric. He's loving this. He's rocking out. He's got his favorite songs going on his uh, headset there. And bang, down to one for Luis. And all he can find is another copy of Shock off the top of the library. And this is Cedric Phillips defeating Luis Scott Vargas and moving on to the next stage here. He still has a lot of work to do, a big handshake from the two. And you can tell Luis... Not happy about it, but yeah. that was uh, that was Cedric, a well-earned victory for him with his uh, with his two copies of Mono White Aggro. So well done, Cedric Phillips. Really well, re really nice play from him. Yeah, that was uh, that was really impressive. I mean, I could say I'd counted him out, and then his draw phases were, were great. That's what the white deck can do. It's not over for Luis though. He can still win his next four and make it to the top 16. So you just got to stay focused, which I'm sure he will. Yeah. What happens now is Luis will get bumped down to the lower bracket here in his group, Group C and he'll have to work his way through. But we are playing double elimination here, so one loss does not boot you from the tournament, but the second one, you're gone. You're losing, packing it. Losing in the first round, though, does require you to have an extra win. You do have to go 4-1 as opposed to 3-1 if you lose later. Yeah, and so that means he's got a lot of winning left to do if Luis is going to make it and be one of the four that escapes this group of death, Group C. He is one of six Magic Hall of Famers in this group. Really, it broke down in a really rough way for the players here because even some of the challengers, right, some of the people that were invited 
like Luis, like Gabriel Nassif, another Hall of Famer, and frankly, like Cedric Phillips. I mean, people these days know Cedric as like a, a content producer. You know, he works for Star City Games. He does podcasts. He does stuff like that. But that guy as has we a saw, pro he, tour he top knows eight. how to play Magic. I mean, he just yeah. played very well there. Yeah. And even, I would say even the MPL players, obviously they're all great players, but if you were to look at the composition of the MPL, there's the Hall of Famers, some of the toughest MPL players all ended up in this group. Yeah, and that's just sort of how it fell down. I mean, when you randomly make these things, that's how it's going to go sometimes, and that's why we're calling this one the Group of Death. But Cedric Phillips, one step away, one step closer. He's going to have to win three of them, two more after this, uh, to cleanly advance and become one of those four players to escape this Group of Death. But in the meantime, uh, well, we're going to just be hanging out and watching a lot more magic over the course of the day here. As uh, If you're just tuning in, yesterday we were on all day and we brought you coverage of uh, groups A and B. And we have our eight players from those groups. And now we're going to knock out the groups from C and D today. And once we do... We'll have our, uh, our 16. 16. Yeah. And that's, of course, a big stepping stone because if you can make it through to that 16, boy, I'll tell you what, you can start seeing that Sunday on the horizon. Yeah, you're only three wins away from making the top four. That's you, right. You get a nice little pay increase. If we looked at our, our prize payouts, there's a jump making to the top 16. So. Might be a little pay increase for him, but for me, it's a very large. <laughs> All right. Well, we've got Becca with Cedric right now.